Many people fear the subject of anger and momentum. Well, because it sounds hard. However, if you know linear momentum, it's easy because they are basically they are basically the same thing. What is momentum? Momentum is the force or speed of movement. Basically, the value of momentum will be the amount of force needed to be applied at opposite direction of the movement to stop that object. Let us first start with a comparison table. Here we have linear motion and rotational motion. As you can see, they both essentially have the same terms, but in rotational motion, uh, an additional term is added like angular or rotational. You can see the resemblance in this. In this. So, if you look at angular, angular momentum, it's basically the same thing as linear momentum, but applied on a location where there is a specific radius into it. Yes. Now for angular momentum, there are two possible equations that can be used. Angular momentum equals linear momentum times radius or rotational inertia times angular velocity. You know that linear momentum and radius from the past circle demonstration I showed. Now how does rotational inertia and angular velocity work? I'll show this all algebraically. Well first we need to know a few equations. We need to know that angular velocity equals the veloc linear velocity over its radius and rotational inertia equals mass times uh, radius squared. So if we plug that in, it will be mass times ra radius squared times velocity over radius and r will cancel out which will leave mvr. Yes. And if we go back up to the first equation, linear momentum equals mv. Oh, now you put that up there for our linear momentum, then mvr. And as you can see, that's how they both work. In this section, I will explain about how rotational inertia works. To start off, I will start with the inertia of a point mass. Two equations will be used about linear momentum. Mass times velocity times radius, which is equal to the rotational inertia times omega. Omega is equal to velocity over r, so velocity is equal to omega r. If we put the equations together, mass times omega times radius times radius equals the inertia times omega. And when simplified, mass times radius squared equals the rotational inertia of a point mass. In the case of a continuous mass, it is a sigma sum of the previous equation, which is, e which is equal to the integral of 0 to m of r squared. The 3D example would be a solid sphere with a radius of large r. The inertia of a solid sphere is the same as the sum of the inertia of hollow spheres, which could be written as the integral from 0 to capital R of 2 thirds radius squared dm. To simplify, we need to use multiple equations. First is density equals mass over volume, when in a small scale equals change of mass over change of volume. The second equation to be used is change in volume is equal to 4 pi radius squared dr. If we put together the two equations, it becomes 2 third r squared density times dv over dm times 4 pi r squared dr over dv times dm. When this equation is simplified, it equals 8 third times density times the integral from 0 to capital R radius to a fourth time, which is the equivalence of a fifteenth r to the fifth power times density. To make the equation into a function of mass, we use the equation mass equals 4 third pi capital R to the third power times density. When this is all put together, the inertia of a sphere equals 8, 8 over 15 capital R to the fifth power times density times mass over 4 third pi r to the third power 
then times density. When this is all simplified, it becomes 2 fifth mass times r squared. Rotational kinetic energy. What is it? Well, first, let's take a look at just kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is divided into one, linear kinetic energy, and two, rotational kinetic energy. Take, an, uh, uh, take a ball here, and let's say it's just an incline rolling down right now. So if it's rolling down, it's rotational kinetic energy in terms of if we convert this to velocity. It's rotational velocity. We just around here in a constant speed all throughout the object. But then it's linear kinetic energy would be obviously since the top's going down it would be the greatest and then it would start decreasing in a manner where the, or the bottom becomes zero and so this is the linear linear kinetic energy and then this is the rotational kinetic energy for rotating objects so now that we know the difference between linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy let's take a look at this equation for the conservation of energy if an object is on the top of an incline then we can say that all its energy is in uh, gravitational potential energy, UG. And KEL is linear kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, which is KER, which can be written like this if we set it up in this equation, plus the thermology and thermal energy, which will evidently be there if it's not in perfect conditions in this world. And therefore, it, we can find it as, the, as this, as so. But if we write it down as an equation, we can disregard the thermal energy for now, and we can set it equal to MGH, which is the gravitational potential energy, then KEL, linear, linear uh, kinetic energy, and then rotational kinetic energy, one half I omega squared, I being rotational inertia, which we have explained earlier, and, and omega being the rotational velocity. Now, take a look at this setup. One rolling cart, one green tape, and one white tape, slightly smaller. Which one would reach the bottom first? Take a moment to pause the video, make your guess, and play. Uh, no. Why did the cart reach the bottom first? Well, the cart should basically be treated as a solid object going down the incline with no rotational kinetic energy. None? Why? Well, the cart even has four wheels, which makes it one half i omega squared times four, doesn't it? But. The mass and radius of the wheels are so small that they are insignificant. So, thus, we can neglect our rotational energy and regard the car as a frictionless block sliding down the incline. And then, if we only consider the one half mv squared and disregard this, the mass being constant, its linear velocity would be the greatest. Then, now, why? Did the green tape roll reach second? Well, now that the rotational kinetic energy takes play, the object uses part of its mechanical energy to rotate right here. And then third, why did the blank white tape reach last? Well, the white tape's mass is spread out more through its system, so its rotational inertia value is greater. And then since this value is greater, its rotational kinetic energy should evidently be greater, making the linear velocity decrease to balance it out. Lastly, the reason our race did not include an actual block or a solid mass that doesn't rotate was because this wasn't a frictionless and air drag less environment. We could not have the perfect conditions. And then, because the block faces initial static friction, and then it faces constant kinetic friction as it moves down the incline, as so, we cannot use it and instead have, we have used the cart for a walk.